good afternoon and welcome to Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. Hudson is a Washington-based policy research organization dedicated to strong and engaged U.S. international leadership and partnership with our allies. Delighted that so many of you could uh, make it today to this uh, book forum on the occasion of the publication of a major new book by Hudson Institute Senior Fellow Seth Cropsey, Sea Blindness, How Political Neglect is Choking American Sea Power and What to Do About It. Now, Seth has written an extraordinary book, one that's a must read, which is available for purchase here, available from Amazon and other booksellers, of course. Uh, great Christmas gift, great Thanksgiving gift, uh, great uh, Mother's Day gift. Uh, no, no. It's, uh, no, but it's, it, what he's done is he's written uh, an extraordinary book that uh, outlines uh, the challenges that uh, we face as a country now that uh, as a result of sequestration, as a result of a uh, changing uh, strategic culture in the United States in which uh, our ability to project power around the world is becoming severely challenged by the cutbacks in spending on our Navy. And uh, Seth uh, does a superb job outlining the problems and then offering very concrete solutions to uh, get our Navy back in the condition that it ought to be in for the global challenges that we as a nation face. And we've assembled an extraordinary group of uh, speakers to uh, talk about uh, this policy challenge and to talk about Seth's book. Uh, we have uh, two panelists we'll be hearing from shortly, Rear Admiral James Stark and uh, Brian Clark of uh, the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Affairs. But uh, first, we have uh, the pleasure to hear from uh, Congressman uh, Mike Gallagher. Congressman Gallagher is, represents the 8th District of Wisconsin, which includes Appleton and Green Bay. He graduated uh, from Princeton University, holds three graduate degrees. But uh, we won't hold that against him uh, here in Washington, including a PhD in international relations from uh, Georgetown. He's a distinguished veteran of uh, the Marine Corps, where he served as a counterintelligence and human intelligence and regional af uh, affairs officer for the Middle East and North Africa. He served on General Petraeus's Central Command Assessment Team, served at the National Counterterrorism Center of the Drug Enforcement Agency, and he also served as the head Republican staffer for the Middle East, North Africa, and counterterrorism on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We view him as uh, one of our own. In fact, uh, when he left uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, we reached out to, uh, to Mike, tried to convince him to join Hudson Institute, but he had other plans. And those plans uh, got him elected to the US Congress. And uh, he is also a student of, uh, at Princeton. He did uh, his undergraduate work with our, with our Hudson Institute colleague, uh, Mike Duran. And so we, we very much view him as a part of the uh, Hudson Institute family. He serves on the House Armed Services Committee, and he's a member of the Sea Power and Projection Forces Subcommittee and the Red Area Subcommittees. And he's also on the Homeland Security Committee. He serves on the Subcommittee on Counterterrorism and Intelligence and Cybersecurity and, and Infrastructure Protection. He is uh, a deeply thoughtful member of Congress. I know he's been immersed this week on issues of tax reform, among other things. Quite worried also about Aaron Rodgers' uh, recovery from uh, his big injury, but uh, we're delighted that he could uh, join us to uh, offer uh, remarks on sea power and also to take questions and answers as well. So, Congressman, right. without any further ado, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Um, well, thank you. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be here today. Uh, I want to thank uh, Rear Admiral Stark and Brian Clark. I look forward to observing as much of the discussion as I can. I, gotta, I turn into a pumpkin at 1 p.m. and got to get back to the Hill. Um, Mike Duran, I don't see in the audience, but he indeed was my first uh, foreign policy professor at Princeton. And I just want the record to show that he gave me a C on my first paper and said it was probably the worst written paper in the class. And so ever since then, I've been on a tear to try and prove him wrong. And so Mike, wherever you are, I want to say, I'm now a member of Congress. You're not. And I intend to exploit this to exact my revenge on you somehow. Um, I also have to recognize Burton Gerber, who was uh, one of my first professors in grad school at Georgetown and uh, became an incredible mentor and friend and is actually my confirmation sponsor. So if I start to break out and, and sweat, it's because the Catholic guilt is now 
coming up here. So, Burton, it's great to see you, and thank you for everything. Um, I actually uh, read this book uh, a month ago, and uh, I think the timing of Seth's book could not be any better. Um, I spend most of my day um, on the Sea Power subcommittee trying to make an argument for why we need to invest uh, heavily. And uh, I firmly believe today we're at an inflection point for American sea power. And on the one hand, as Seth chronicles, we have a new president who made this very visible campaign promise uh, of a 350-ship Navy, 355-ship Navy. It's a defining promise of the campaign. But on the other, the military rebuild that the president promised has yet to materialize. Uh, part of that is the Hill's fault. But many of us on the Hill were disappointed when the president's initial budget came over at only 3% more than the wholly inadequate plan of his predecessor. And acting under Secretary of the Navy, Thomas D. recently cast doubt on our ability to build a 355-ship Navy until the mid-century. I was heartened to hear that the Secretary of the Navy publicly disavowed these comments, but it's clear that there is still significant daylight between the President's vision and the current available resources under the budget caps. The key to ending the caps is the key is ending the caps through a bipartisan deal, which can get 60 votes in the Senate, and that's going to be very difficult to do. And to do that, advocates of a strong national defense in general and sea power in particular, I think, need to change our approach. What we've been doing for one reason or another just has not been resonating. More than six years into the BCA, our arguments and our warnings are falling flat. Seth has a line in his book that encapsulates the entire dilemma for me. He writes, American sea power needs more than funding. It needs articulate, strategic-minded leadership that can connect national sea power goals with persuasive arguments to achieve them. In other words, while talking about getting to 355 ships is important, I think we first need to explain to the American public why sea power is central to our national security. And taking a page from the Dean of Sea Power, John Lehman's book, we have to make a strategy-first argument from which requirements and fleet size flow as a natural and intuitive result. So I'm just a freshman member of Congress. I'm 10 months in, and my background, while it is in a maritime service, I spent most of my time on active duty uh, running around the desert. Uh, in fact, I remember being uh, deployed to Western Iraq, and uh, we'd always get these updates from the Commandant saying we needed to get in touch with our amphibious roots, and we'd kind of look around and say, well, that's kind of hard here. I had a Lance Corporal who used to take a big swig of water, and then he'd go like this and spit it out. And I'm like, Lance Corporal, what are you doing? He said, sir, I'm just getting in touch with my amphibious roots over here. Um, I throw that out as a disclaimer. Uh, but what I'd like to do today is try to walk through briefly w uh, a strategic case for sea power as I see it, and how we as advocates can hopefully be a little more successful going forward. To me, the case for sea power starts with geography. Uh, North America is functionally a continent-sized island. America is fortunate to have neighbors like Canada and Mexico. And there's no conceiver to, conceivable challenger to American he uh, hegemony in the Western Hemisphere. Since the Second World War, our core geostrategic goal has stayed remarkably consistent. We've forward deployed forces to deter potential aggressors attempting hegemony in Europe or Northeast Asia. As the 20th century American strategist Nicholas Spikeman wrote, our constant concern in peacetime must be to see that no nation or alliance of nations is allowed to emerge as a dominating power in either of the two regions of the old world from which our security could be threatened. To this end, America has defended forward, man manning a series of ramparts along the Eurasian littoral from Western Europe through the Middle East to East Asia. America's core strategic positioning along this Eurasian littoral follows Spikeman's logic of what he called the Rimland. Spikeman viewed the Rimland as the crucial zone of conflict between sea power and land power. It encompasses what we now view as the world's most important strategic locations, Western Europe, the Middle East, South Asia, and East Asia. As Spikeman wrote, who controls the Rimland rules Eurasia, who rules Eurasia controls the destinies of the world. Spikeman's writing on the centrality of the Rimland to world politics are often paired with those of Halford Mackinder, a prominent British strategist around the turn of the century. Mackinder also conceived of grand strategy through geographic terms, but he favored land power. He famously described how the Eurasian heartland of Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia was the pivot around which global power turned. So the Cold War, in a sense, was the ultimate showdown between Spikeman on the one hand and Mackinder on the other. The United States and the Free World Coalition enjoyed 
a considerable advantage along the Eurasian rimland. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, tightly controlled the Eurasian heartland. As Seth chronicles in his book, American Cold War strategists conceived of Europe as a peninsula, surrounded by the Baltic and North Seas on one flank and the Mediterranean on the other. This quintessential Rimland strategy meant that the United States and its NATO allies counted upon a decisive advantage in the maritime domain. While the NATO allies could afford rough parity and indeed even conventional inferiority with the Soviets on land, as long as NATO maintained maritime superiority, it could threaten the Soviets on their vulnerable flanks. Anything resembling parity on the high seas, on the other hand, would have led to disaster because the United States was physically separated from its allies and the most likely theater of battle, supplies, and reinforcements would have to travel over the high seas. Mere naval parity, therefore, would not mean stalemate. It would mean slaughter for allied forces in Europe. Only a decisive advantage at sea could guarantee the safe and timely arrival of American military might to defend Europe. Today, I would submit to you, we are once again seeing the theories of Spikeman and Mackinder play out on the world stage. Once more, the United States and its allies lead a Rimland coalition against autocratic aggressors. This time, however, we face not a heartland power, but a Rimland state. The sea-facing geography of Chinese power compounds the challenge facing our transoceanic alliance and means that command of the seas is actually more difficult than it was when we faced the Soviets. While maritime superiority was the implicit foundation of our Cold War defense strategy on the operational level, our Cold War Navy was focused on power projection and hitting the vulnerable Soviet flanks. Today, while power projection would be critical in a war against China, the growing capability of the Chinese Navy means that we would first have to establish sea control in the Indo-Asia Pacific before the true hammer of American power projection could be brought to bear. This shifting operational focus from power projection to sea control makes a balanced and powerful naval force structure more important than ever before. If the Navy is not able to first clear the seas, our power projection forces would face real difficulties in entering the fight. After all, our allies and forward deployed assets are still oceans away from reinforcement in many cases. Without decisive maritime superiority, our CONUS-based forces would not be able to swiftly arrive in theater. In a future conflict, time will not be on our side. There will be intense global pressure to end the conflict before it escalates further, even if it means locking in Chinese gains. The, no long, the longer it takes for decisive American forces to fight their way across the Pacific or within the Pacific, the more likely the conflict is to be settled on unfavorable terms. The lesson to me is that we need a Navy that's capable of decisive fleet action near our enemy's home waters, a Navy that can win quickly. Parity in the maritime domain, therefore, is a recipe for wartime defeat. The case for absolute and unquestioned maritime dominance is essential, not just for the conduct of the next war, but for its prevention. And if that's not worrisome enough, our challenges internationally are even greater today. As Seth compellingly lays out, we face today revisionist aggressors in every keynote across the Eurasian landmass. The 21st century axis of revisionists with Seth lays out in future scenarios as Russia, China, and Iran, but to which we could easily add North Korea, ISIS, and affiliated extremist groups seeks to end American international leadership, or at the very least undermine it. While these actors do not always agree on solutions, they share common dreams of ending and replacing the global order as we know it. And as Spikeman warned over 70 years ago, advances in technology and communication mean that the oceans buffering the United States are not barriers, but highways. A balance of power in the transatlantic and transpacific zones is an absolute prerequisite for the independence of the new world and the preservation of the power position of the United States. There is no safe defensive position on this side of the oceans. Hemispheric defense, Spikeman says, is no defense at all. This insight was that if unified under a single hegemon or an unfriendly alliance of great powers, the Eurasian landmass would effectively encircle North America. To prevent this outcome, we must vigorously defend our interests and our allies in the world's key venue for strategic competition, the Eurasian Rimland. Just as we did three times during the 20th century, the United States and its coalition 
must rely on its unquestioned command of the seas to prevent the emergence of Eurasian hegemons. This stakes could not be any higher. So like I said, uh, I'm just a Marine. I wish I had all the solutions, but to borrow a phrase from Mike Tyson, uh, everyone has a plan until they get sworn into Congress. Um, but I would challenge all of you in this room that when you're discussing the imperative for sea power in the future, do not, for, do not forget to include the why as part of your discussion. Because as Seth so astutely points out, as advocates for American naval power, we've skipped a step. We've assumed our audience shares our understanding for why an unquestioned Navy is important in the first place. And as someone who is new to politics, I'm still learning on a daily basis from my constituents about what is on their minds. I truly feel they would be open to a strategic case for sea power and a higher top line, or at least a predictable top line budget, if someone took the time to explain it properly. Now, of course, folks in my districts would rather talk about Aaron Rodgers than Nicholas Spikeman. So we need to find a new way to translate the strategic case for sea power into an elevator pitch that voters across the country can intuitively understand. Unfortunately, up to this point, I'm afraid we've had a little sea blindness of our own. And I think Seth's book is an essential and important contribution to this fight. And it was truly an honor to be invited here today and to share a few thoughts for you. And let me just make the final case uh, that I get to see as a member of Congress for why we need to devote ourselves to this problem and why uh, the Hudson Institute is such an essential part of this. Uh, two days ago, or yesterday, I don't remember, I've been in tax reform uh, myopia. Um, I called up uh, all the kids from my district who I get to nominate to uh, the service academies. And I called up a kid from Bayport High School who got the nomination for the Naval Academy. And I just found myself, and these kids are incredible. You see their resumes today, they're absolutely incredible. For all of you who despair about the future of the world, you gotta see these kids, they're unbelievable. Um, and I just found myself thinking, in five years or six years, this kid from Northeast Wisconsin is gonna be deployed on a ship somewhere around the world, maybe fighting the same wars that I was fighting 10 years ago. And I just think, as hard as it is, as hard as the political climate can be in this town, we have to do right by those kids. I have to be able, when my time in Congress ends, to look that kid in the eye and say, we handed you the absolute best military in the world with the best training and a clear mission and a sense that what you're fighting for is a noble cause. And I think in light of what we're asking that kid to do, our own petty political squabbles start to seem a little bit smaller. So thank you for having me here today. I appreciate it. We have real naval experts here, so I might defer a question. I'm happy to answer any <laughs> questions you have. Okay, this is the easiest I've ever gotten off. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I might be projecting a little bit of uh, paranoia and ignorance with this question. However, um, as much as you can tell me, as a and us as civilians, um, do you believe there are covert operations going on in the South China Sea uh, involving our military and? our adversaries' militaries? Uh, the short answer and honest answer is I don't know. Um, even on the Armed Services Committee and the Homeland Security Committee, I'm not read in uh, to those programs, so I can't really give you uh, a good answer. I'm sure there are any number of things going on that we don't know about. I do fear, though, that when it comes to um, sort of future conflict in the South and East China Sea, uh, we're not thinking uh, creatively. Uh, when it comes to any issue of future war, um, we're falling behind our adversaries. I don't know if anyone paid attention. I believe it was the head of Army uh, cyber Command, or the Army Cyber, I forget, the G2 for something, um, basically said when it comes to issues of cyber and the electro and electromagnetic warfare, uh, we've already fallen behind our adversaries. So this isn't a matter of us sort of losing pace with Russia and China. It means we're already behind. Mm -hmm. And I've just been stunned time and again as someone who received a letter from OPM saying that my military records have been hacked a few years ago, basically said, good luck, thank you for your service that whenever things like this happen, uh, for whatever reason, there is no Sputnik moment that requires us to wake up. Um, 
This last month, October, was National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and it began with the revelation that two years ago, another NSC contract employee took information off, uh, plugged a, a, a USB into his home laptop that had Kaspersky software on it, and it beamed information back to the Russians. I mean, we're hemorrhaging information right now. We still have the most sophisticated offensive weapons, but our defenses are incredibly porous. Um, and I don't think we've begun to think what that means for that sort of mobile, connected platform um, that is deployed right now in the Pacific. So that's not really a direct answer to your question, but uh, I, that's why I'm always skeptical of sort of third offset um, arguments. Um, I suspect even if we discover some magical third offset, our adversaries will rapidly discover an offset to that offset, and then we'll talk about the fourth offset and the fifth offset, and in this offset escalation, what will matter is just having more platforms. And they don't all need to be exquisitely um, postured, if you will. And we haven't really woken up to that fact. And I think if indeed there was a clear demand signal from the president every single day and a secretary of the Navy willing to make the case for, we need at a minimum 355 ships. And remember, that's the bare minimum that the Navy says they need to fulfill their operational requirements. We don't even know if our defense industrial base is up to the task of producing it in a meaningful timeline. There are extraordinarily supply, extraordinarily supply chain vulnerabilities built into all of these major ship programs and weapon systems, and we don't have a clear understanding of how that works right now. So I'm responding to your paranoia with more paranoia, but that's how I see it. Sir. Auto Crush with Sea Power Magazine. Happy birthday to Mara for both wow. of us. Uh, you talked about needing more platforms. Like years old. <laughs> yeah. uh, and needing more platforms. There's also an, the Navy is in dire shape as far as readiness. So there's an uh, emerging debate on do we really need to focus on expanding the Navy and the other services, or put the money that's coming up in, into improving readiness? Uh, there's a pretty good chance that we're not going to get enough to do both. Sure. Uh, you know, I maybe this is a. a, a I just don't think we should be forced to choose between both. I mean, ideally, we could walk and chew gum at the same time if Congress was willing to appropriate the right level of money and uh, we were willing to make the case, because um, that's really a false choice uh, between the two. And uh, delaying um, shipbuilding now will have consequences uh, in the future for the sake of readiness. And that's why we were so dismayed by the 603 number. Now, my professor, Bert Gerber, of course, would remind me that the nation's $21 trillion in debt and Pentagon spends a lot of money, and it's not always spent efficiently. And I will say it is hard to make the case sometimes as a so-called defense hawk for why we need to be spending more money. Uh, but I just would submit that the biggest way we waste money uh, in the military is through operating under continuing resolutions and not having a predictable budgetary planning cycle. And if you talk to anyone in the Pentagon, I suspect they would tell you that you know, we would settle for a slightly smaller number if we had some actual sort of five-year sense of of where we're going and some certainty because the amount of days, I forget the exact number that we've been operating under CRs is absolutely abysmal and we're killing ourselves right now. Nine years. Yeah, nine years. That's a long time. I still had a high and tight nine years ago. Sir. You talk a great deal about the Eurasian Rimland. But I wondered, do you feel our defenses are adequate for Guam, Hawaii, and Los Angeles, considering the threat from North Korea? Yeah. So I think with, you know, over a 90% a likelihood, we could shoot a, a missile down. Um, I think, you know, notwithstanding uh, Kim Jong-un's ability to range Alaska right now, I, I still think the threat, that threat is, uh, is less urgent in my mind than what a nuclear capability would mean for his ability to project power in the region and threaten uh, South Korea. And really the most difficult aspect of this whole problem is not so much Guam as it is Seoul, right? I mean, you have a, a metropolitan area that has 26 million people. I think it's the second largest metropolitan area in the world. And we just don't have missile defense systems that have been built or invented. You could surround the place with iron domes and it wouldn't be an effective defense against the thousands of pieces of artillery that are dug into Quezon Heights. And so any Kinetic conflict uh, on the Korean Peninsula would involve massive losses of life. And the THAAD missile batteries that we have deployed to South Korea are there to protect our own troop positions. They're not there to protect Seoul. So that, to me, as I analyze this problem, is really the most difficult part of it, not necessarily 
uh, the way in which he can currently threaten Los Angeles or Alaska. That being said, I do think if this isn't resolved, there will come a point when we need to ask ourselves, are we willing to accept him having an ICBM, the nuclear-capable ICBM, that can range Chicago, God forbid, Green Bay, um, or are we willing to? I mean, are we willing to allow him that capability, or are we going to take the uh, the necessary steps to rob him of that capability? And I've been struggling with with this intellectually because, if indeed, as all the the Asia experts would tell you, um, he is not going to give up his nuclear weapons, then I'm left with two options uh, intellectually as an analyst. I can either live with a nuclear armed North Korea. Or I could resource a serious regime change strategy. And no one is willing to go that far right now. I think I give the administration a lot of credit for the steps that they've taken on the economic front to impose maximum pressure. I think it's been very useful and going in a positive direction, uh, though we've seen South Korea bend to, uh, to Chinese demands uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, on the military front, I think they've, they've had the right posture, increasing our presence. We have three carrier. Battle groups right now deploy. I think we had seven carriers underway at one time. When was the last time that happened? Brian will know. Um, but uh, um, I think there is a missing third element of how can we undermine the regime in ways that guys like Burton used to do uh, across the world. And I do believe we sort of lost that art of, of information warfare uh, and political warfare. And uh, I just think we need to be thinking about that, at least if all options are indeed on the table. Sure. Get back and then there. I've exhausted all my knowledge, though. So one, one small question: uh, What's your opinion about the littoral combat ship? What lessons can be learned from sure. you no know, its successes and mostly its failures? I think the Coronado is the only LCS that's actually active. What has the Navy and the Congress learned about it? Thank yeah. you. So I think it's worth uh, rereading Bob Work's um, autopsy of, of the program. I think it holds a lot of enduring lessons. I think anytime you have an unstable uh, set of requirements um, and an unstable design, it's going to result in inefficiencies over the long term. Um, that would be my primary lesson. But that being said, you talk to the sailors that are downrange. Uh, you talk to people that are on the USS Coronado, which they got a harpoon on that thing right now. It's an incredible capability, and they want more of it. And I think in that sort of sea control environment, um, you're going to need, I mean, we can't just, there, there are certain harbors and areas that destroyers can't go into. So we are going to need a small surface combatant. And no one has yet made an argument to me as to why the Navy needs less than 52 small surface combatants. And I know the Navy right now is um, uh, gearing up to make a selection for the fast frigate. And we're gearing up in northeast Wisconsin to compete for that. Um, but I do think uh, at the end of the day, notwithstanding some of the challenges early on, we now have a capability that is getting better uh, and that the, the Navy wants more of. Oh, sorry. I, would, I was supposed to go to you first. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, last month, there was a report that HP, as a precondition to selling their cybersecurity software to Russia, they have to supply or furnish the source code. And apparently, it, that, that's what they're doing, which is the same. This is the same software that the Pentagon uses. Yeah. And on the one hand, you have sanctions on Russia. On the other hand, you're allowing U.S. companies to sell their software and give the source code to the Russians. How can that be? Um, indeed, how can it be? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I just, as I've tried to dig into this question every day, I unearth something that causes me to lose sleep at night. I was uh, meeting with a cybersecurity company yesterday, and they basically made the case for why we just need to stop buying anything that touches software that has been made in China. Because we're going to wake up 10 years from now, and it is going to be a very dangerous, dangerous uh, world. Uh, so I don't know uh, how that's possible. I will say, when it comes to investment in the United States, Congress is slowly starting to wake up. Uh, we have a, a CFIUS reform bill uh, that is out right now uh, that John Cornyn in the Senate is the leader, and I'm a co-sponsor in the House, that's taking a look at <coughs> some of the investments, not necessarily the Russians, but they're part of it. But the Chinese have been very aggressive in making investments uh, in AI in particular, um, and they're very creative in ways that they uh, undermine the CFIUS process, or they take minority stakes in companies, or they structure the investment in such a way as it doesn't uh, pop up on a radar. Um, and so that's one positive step in this space. But I tend to think we're sort of at like the apex of everything nice about the internet right now, and we're headed into a very dark world that we're not prepared for. Um, but at the end of the day, 
I just believe that all these capabilities um, in the cyber domain, um, it still is fundamentally a human endeavor, right? Most of the failures we've seen have been human failures. Um, NSA contract failures have been the most prominent, um, and there's always going to be someone who falls victim to a spear phishing attack. I just had a company in Northeast Wisconsin that is, is being held for ransom, uh, with ransomware. Um, so there's always going to be a human component. But on the positive side, we're just going to need to recruit the best and brightest human beings to solve problems in this space. And if you look at the ways in which the different services are trying to do this right now, they're all trying to do the right thing, but it's too slow and it's too conventional. In the best case scenario, the Marine Corps and the Navy and the Army are going to adopt a SOCOM model for cyber warriors of the future, right? So this is the so-called let the nerds be the nerds strategy, which is all well and good. They'll have a separate career track, and they'll get to do their thing, and that will provide a good capability to the fleet. But I just have doubts as to whether the military is going to be able to recruit the best and the brightest cyber talent in the first place. In other words, I don't think sort of that in that Venn diagram of you have, you know, 18-year-olds uh, who want to do pull-ups and get a high and tight and run around and beat their chest is not the intersection between that and 18-year-olds who want to code and have long hair and do different things. That intersection is going to be very small. And so I think we need to think creatively about how do we recruit the best and the brightest in this space and give them a more flexible career track, whether that's having a separate cyber academy or a capstone process after high school or college or a service academy. I don't know. But I'm just convinced that the human capital that we are recruiting and investing into this problem, uh, while decent, is not good enough, and it's not keeping up with the Russians and the Chinese. Sir. Uh, my name is Mitsuo Nakai, uh, Japan native, U.S. citizen. Uh, in your personal opinion, how reliable our missile defense system we have, including that system? Great question. Um, based on the statistics I've seen, uh, they're highly reliable, but if the high end is 90% or 98%, that's still a worrying 10 and 2%. Um, particularly when you're talking about the defense of Japan or you're talking about the defense of, of Guam uh, or the defense of any, um, any major population center uh, in Asia. And so I don't think we can put all our eggs in the basket of missile defense, because um, who knows? I mean, if the, if the North Koreans really um, that's also sort of assuming there's only a, like a few missiles that are launched, right? Um, and I think we underestimate, or, or we, we, we tend to sort of assume a rationality uh, when it comes to analyzing these different scenarios that may not exist. And as all of you know who've studied these problems, strange things can happen when conflict breaks out. And the only thing we know for certain is that uh, we don't know for certain what's going to happen. And so I just would be wary about saying that because, and I'm not suggesting you're saying this, but that because we have sophisticated missile defense systems, um, that we don't need sort of an aggressive uh, offensive strategy when it comes to this problem. Anybody else? I've talked too much. These people are much smarter than me. We shouldn't have time for them. So, well, thank you for letting me be here. I really appreciate it. So, okay. Wait, this one's not mine. So I was just going to steal that to give to my mom for Mother's Day. Thank you. I'll come over and autograph it. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. I'm Seth Cropsey. Uh, and would like to thank Congressman Gallagher for uh, coming over here and giving his excellent remarks um, and uh, for your fine questions. I'm going to abbreviate my remarks here. We have until 1.30, I think, right? Good. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to cut back my remarks somewhat so that... Uh, um, we have time for everybody else to speak. Uh, not a laughing matter. The, the Navy lost 17 sailors between June and August this year in two separate ship-to-ship -ship collisions. A recently published uh, Navy investigation found that in each case, the crew was, this is a quote, the crew was unprepared for the situation in which they found themselves 
through a lack of preparation, ineffective command and control, and deficiencies in training and preparations for navigation. You'll hear more about the results of this investigation, I expect, today, but it's clear from the document that the insufficiencies of training and skills bear a large measure of responsibility for the accidents. These cannot be separated from the increasing financial constraints under which the Navy has operated for decades. Describing such constraints is an important part of my book. Um, that's this one. Uh, I'll return to this shortly, but wish to say a few words first to put the Navy's challenges today into a, a, a historical context. This past May marked the 80th anniversary of Neville Chamberlain's ascent to Brit Britain's premiership. Chamberlain's national government, which lasted until the outbreak of the Second World War, is best known for its policy of appeasement toward Nazi Germany. It's easy to forget the widespread support for Chamberlain's appeasement policy before the March 1939 annexation of, the, of Czechoslovakia. The British public, uh, scarred by the First World War and frightened by descriptions of bomber attacks that would flatten major cities, overwhelmingly backed Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. In fact, so did most of the British military. The Versailles Treaty and subsequent Locarno Treaties had made the Rhineland Britain's proverbial security frontier. But the steep defense cuts of the 1920s and 30s reduced Britain's ability to carry out her treaty obligations. Readiness is the ability of a nation's military to meet its strategic obligations. In an era of variable military budgets, Congressman was talking about that a moment ago and the need for consistency, and increasing threats, readiness has become a common topic of discussion with the American defense establishment. Sufficient budgets are critical to maintaining military strength. Without effective, consistent funding, all branches of the military are forced to choose between short-term and longer-term goals. However, readiness extends beyond simply funding. A nation's military preparedness includes the strategic imagination of its leaders, and its population's political will. Without strategic imagination and will, a nation's military will be unprepared. So unlike Britain's planners, American strategic, American strategic leadership was more willing to confront uh, the problem of Japanese aggressiveness. Um, throughout the 1930s, America's naval leaders correctly assumed that the next naval confrontation would be in the Pacific. They conducted their fleet exercises accordingly, but materially, the US remained unprepared for conflict. America did not begin large-scale naval preparations until 1940 with the passage of the Two Ocean Navy Act. So thinking about America's historic naval readiness requires looking at, uh, at today's international environment three potential adversaries stand out, China, Russia, and Iran. And then, of course, is North Korea. So I guess that makes more than three. Each presents a different sort of threat, but all would engage US sea power. China's dual goal in a conflict would be to deny American access to its Pacific Island bases and allies, and then overwhelm American and allied regional forces with a seemingly inexhaustible supply of missiles um, while using amphibious forces to try to seize uh, Taiwan and other key locations. Russia, for its part, lacks China's resources but still presents a challenge. Although its surface fleet has fallen into disarray, its submarine force has remained modern. Um, same thing can be true is truly said of their air forces. Not quite as much, but they're keeping pace. Iran lack, lacks the high-end capabilities of Russia and China, but makes up for it by using irregular forces, cheap missile systems, and fast attack craft. 
intended to deny U.S. access to the Arabian Gulf and the Middle East more broadly. The capability of potential adversaries is, is one component of readiness. And here I, I should have prefaced my remarks by saying that I'm giving you a, uh, a, a um, smaller, condensed, but of course insufficient uh, synopsis of the key points in the book, which is to say you still need to buy the book. Uh, the capability of potential adversaries is simply one component, as I say, of readiness. Without strategic imagination and will, as I noted, the U.S. will not be prepared sufficiently for future confrontations. For example, uh, most of Britain in the late 18th century did not expect the longevity of the resistance that was mounted in the, in, in the colonies. Uh, uh, India uh, ignored signs of Chinese hostility and didn't imagine that a significant military force could penetrate its rugged northern border. Um, there are plenty of other examples. But in retrospect, the strategic complacency of all these powers is evident as are solutions that would have at least mitigated the issues that were encountered in conflict. By remaining complacent and in many, many uh, categor significant categories unready, the United States invites a parallel result. The Navy's primary role in the 1990s was expeditionary warfare facilitation and air support. The September 11th attacks and subsequent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq led American military planners to turn once again to the Navy. American carriers and surface ships supported coalition forces in both Middle Eastern ground wars. Presidents Bush, Obama, and now Trump have all continued to rely upon the Navy to facilitate America's long-term counterinsurgency campaigns. In addition, increasing threats from China, Iran, and Russia have put deterrence and presence missions uh, more forward on the Navy's agenda. But, and this is extremely important, as the Navy's role expanded, its force size shrank. The fleet reached its modern apex at nearly 600 ships in the closing years of the Cold War. It has shrunk since then from about 300 and 300 plus ships in 2000 to 275 in, two, in 2016 with a 272 ship low in 2015. The number today is about 272 or six. As commitments increased while force size diminished, Navy increased deployment lengths and stresses during deployment while sacrificing dwell time for its sailors and putting more pressure on them during deployment. Sailors work very long hours. Congressman is right to be concerned about the young men and women who are um, seeking entrance to the Naval Academy today, to the service academies today. Some American sailors, like the crew of littoral combat ship 204, have seen their four or five month tours doubled. According to the Government Accountability Office, 37% of cruisers and destroyers home ported in Japan lack cer combat certification the naval air wing has been cut to 60% of its operational strength. Marine aviators are six times more likely to die in accidents than their naval counterparts. An aging and shrinking air wing cuts pilot training time, leading to mechanical failures and deadly mistakes. These are the indicators of force hollowness. Despite its technological advancement and the discipline of its sailors and Marines, Americans sea services are increasingly at risk. So the Navy and Marine Corps' current stresses and shortfalls occur at a time of relative peace. Today, the U.S. is engaged in combat operations in the greater Middle East, but against low-level insurgents rather than states. Despite the hopes of America's Cold War leadership, great power competition is back with us. However, the fleet today is overworked and undermanned. 
In wartime, America would risk sending exhausted sailors into harm's way aboard non-combat certified ships without the backing of a properly stocked inventory of anti-ship missiles. It would call upon Marines to storm beaches as their transport aircraft and fighters are experiencing serious maintenance problems. President Trump's $603 billion budget makes a start, but I am in complete agreement with Congressman Gallagher again. Uh, a 10 percent increase in the defense budget falls far short of the additional yearly amount needed to reach the administration's 350 ship goal. There is no substitute for requisite funding. But readiness, as I've mentioned, is more than a question of funding and material assets. Without the imagination to conceive of threats and the willpower to fight a war to the finish, a robust military uh, has significantly less value. Material readiness involves maintaining the requisite military power to deter and defeat an adversary, while strategic readiness entails understanding the nature of threats our nation faces and predicting potential escalation scenarios. Absent political will, however, simple preparations for conflict won't bring victory. Political will manifests itself in two ways. The willingness to fund and support a properly sized military force in peace and an acceptance of the costs that a great power war would require. And that, it's not just us. It's all societies struggle to balance security needs with economic desires. Long-term economic growth in certain sectors enables military power, but there is a short-term trade-off between military preparedness uh, and overall economic success. Liberal societies in particular struggle with balancing these conflicting objectives. Built on politically tolerable taxes and international free trade, these societies are loath to forego comfort for security absent an immediate and understandable threat. And again, the Congressman's remarks uh, about articulating it and making it clear to constituents what kind of a threat we face are, in my opinion, absolutely on target. Higher taxes are required to fund properly sized military budgets. If Americans want to enjoy the benefits of remaining a world power, and if they wish to see American ideals and norms remain general standards, they must be willing to accept a higher financial cost in taxes and military expenditures. The political will to finance a military is directly linked to the acceptance of the consequences warfare brings. The great power conflict with China, even absent a nuclear exchange, would be devastating. At sea, the U.S. could lose multiple surface combatants, possibly a capital ship, and a, uh, a variable number of amphibious transports, depending upon the conditions on the ground. Any exchange longer than several days would result in the loss of hundreds of aircraft and, at a minimum, lots of soldiers and Marines on the ground in the thousands. The Iraq and Afghan wars averaged two deaths per day between 2001 and 2014. Vietnam averaged 11 fatalities between 1961 and 1975 per day. The First and Second World Wars averaged nearly 300 military deaths per day during the conflict. It does not take an ideologue to understand that the cost of war is terrible. So finally here, like everything in international politics, our current situation is not new. Britain was faced with a choice throughout the 1930s to rearm, confront a rising adversary, maintain its international position, or gamble that accommodation would bring its opponents into a society of nations joined by seemingly universal moral standards. It departed, it abdicated its global responsibilities. It abandoned its allies to a predatory power, thereby sacrificing British honor and security for transient economic prosperity. 
Edward Hallett Carr, one of the founders of modern international political realism, wrote his book, The 20 Years Crisis, as a critique of idealism. An allegedly hard-headed realist, he attacks then-parliamentarian Winston Churchill as a political opportunist and advocates appeasement as the only rational policy. Britain's military deterioration had forced the UK to all but accept defeat in the military conflict. History, of course, proved Carr wrong and Churchill right. Britain ultimately and thankfully confronted the Nazis, but as Churchill points out, it did so at the last possible moment. American naval power is stretched to the limit today. The US is unprepared for war materially, strategically, and politically. More important than addressing issues of operational tempo, weapons, stockpiles, and ship numbers is confronting the issue of will. We must either choose to finance a properly sized fleet for our present and future strategic obligations and accept the attendant financial hardship and potential cost of war, or abandon our role as a global power and accept the consequences. What we cannot do is remain a great power without being willing to pay for it. Thank you. Um, uh, I think you've seen descriptions of our distinguished panel. Ken Weinstein introduced them before. Uh, Rear Admiral Jim Stark here is former president of the Naval War College. Brian Clark, former special assistant to the chief of naval operations. You'll find a full description in the profession of their careers in Hudson's uh, flyer. I, I also see Brian McGrath here today. As a naval officer, uh, Brian authored the Navy's 2007 Maritime Strategy and is, as many of you may know, a prolific writer on maritime affairs. And I'd like to ask Brian to come up and offer some thoughts if he has any, which he does um, at, uh, at, at some point or another. Well, Brian, why don't we do, why don't we do um, let's then you'll follow, and then we'll, yeah, I, I, miss, I miscued you. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Jim? Yep. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, rather. First thing I think I'd like to do is uh, thank Seth for his, his important contribution to our national debate on defense strategy and naval force structure. Sea blindness is a very candid, insightful, and much needed look at our Navy. I also want to uh, compliment Congressman Gallagher on his remarks. I thought he got it exactly right. What I'd like to do today is examine two tragic collisions that occurred this past summer in the Seventh Fleet and then relate them to Seth's premise. As a result of those events, as Seth noted, 17 sailors lost their lives. Now, just last week, the Navy released, released two very important reports on these accidents. The first report just covered USS Fitzgerald and USS McCain, and my remarks will focus on those two collisions. The second covered those two incidents, plus the collision of Lake Champlain with a Korean fishing vessel in May and the grounding of Antietam in Tokyo Bay in January. Both reports are extremely detailed and use timelines, diagrams, charts and photos to show the events leading up to the collisions, the resulting damage, exactly what was done wrong, and who was responsible. It's important to note that the Navy, in my mind, is unique among the services in its willingness to publicly and candidly analyze its errors and to assign responsibility. To a very unusual degree in today's world, the Navy holds people accountable. The result in these four cases has been the firing of all the commanding officers, most of the executive officers, the squadron commander, the battle group commander, and the three-star admiral who commands the Seventh Fleet. Uh, I've, I've been informed that that was the first firing of a fleet commander sec since the Second World War. We've also seen the early retirement of the Pacific Fleet commander, a four-star admiral, as well as the deputy CNO for surface warfare in Washington. That's both unusual and impressive. But as I'll describe later, I don't think it goes far enough in resolving the problem. 
even before the two reports were released, it was certainly possible to see some things that were very concerning and to reach some tentative conclusions as to what might have gone wrong. In talking about these, I'll divide them into specific shipboard problems, those that took place within the lifelines uh, and were directly involved in the, in the accidents, and then the more systemic problems, the latent failures, if you will, that over the long term made these accidents more likely. Before I do that, just let me say a couple of words about the difficulty of maneuvering a ship at sea in a high traffic situation. Operating around other ships, and I'm sure the naval officers who are in the audience will back me up on this, operating around other ships, particularly at night, can be enormously confusing. Yes, there are rules of the road governing how ships maneuver around each other, who has the right of way, and which ships need to maneuver to keep clear. But those rules are designed to cover situations primarily where it's just two ships that are closing. And when there are multiple vessels, it becomes much more complex. To ensure the safe operation of, e of his ship, each Navy commanding officer provides written guidance in what are called standing orders, which define how he wants the officers and crew to react in certain situations. And while such orders are individually tailored for each ship, I found that most are pretty similar. For example, Navy ships are typically, typically required to track and plot CPAs, that is the closest point of approach, on every ship that comes within 10 nautical miles. And to call the captain to report any ship with a CPA within about three miles. It varies on ship to ship, three to five miles. And in every case that I know of, those standing orders state that if an officer of the deck is confused, concerned, has any doubts, or is in any way uneasy, he's to call the captain. And it's always emphasized, when in doubt, call me. In the case of Fitzgerald in particular, it is very clear that those orders were not obeyed. So what can we see wrong just from the initial news reports? First and foremost, Fitzgerald's captain was not on the bridge at the time of the collision. And we know this because he was reported to be injured while sleeping in his in-port cabin. In my view, the, the CO should never have left the, left the bridge in the first place. In high traffic areas such as the approaches to Tokyo Bay, I would always stay up on the bridge, even at night, just sitting in the big captain's chair, half asleep, but still listening to everything that was going on. Second, as I mentioned earlier, the officer of the deck, the OOD as we call it, is always required to inform the captain about any close contacts something that should be done while the other vessels are still several miles away. That report alone should have brought the CO immediately up to the bridge. The fact that he wasn't there indicates to me that he was never called. The third, the CIC, the Combat Information Center, which is a large space filled with radar and advanced equipment where the ship maintains its overall tactical picture, is supposed to be plotting all the radar contacts just like the bridge is supposed to be doing and then they compare the two solutions to make sure they agree. Where were they in all of this? Fourth, what were the lookouts doing? It sounded from news reports like the ship didn't maneuver even when it was obvious a collision was imminent. The ship's lookouts are supposed to have been calling ever more urgent warnings as the situation developed. Finally, the fact that so many sailors were caught in the berthing compartments at the time of the collision indicates to me that the collision alarm wasn't sounded before impact. That should have awakened the crew and gotten them out of the berthing compartments ahead of the collision. If that had happened, the number of fatalities would have been a lot less. Both the last week's Navy reports indicated that all of these problems that I've just mentioned actually occurred and contributed to the collisions. In addition, there were a slew of other highly unprofessional mistakes. No emergency whistle signals were sounded. No attempts were made to contact the other vessels on bridge-to-bridge -bridge radio. And early evasive action to avoid collision was never attempted or even contemplated. It's imp important to note that the collisions occurred in traffic separation schemes, which are like inbound and outbound lanes on a nautical interstate. In the case of USS Fitzgerald, the ship was trying to cut across the traffic lanes on its way out of Tokyo Bay. That's analogous to walking across the beltway during rush hour. But from reading the report, it appears that the officer of the deck was not even aware that she was crossing a traffic lane. 
that leads me to assume that she was relying on electronic navigation, i.e., she didn't examine the navigation chart. Making it all worse, the ship's surface search radar was not tuned properly, so the watchstanders couldn't detect or track the other ships. In the case of McCain, the ship was transiting within a traffic separation scheme heading into Singapore, surrounded ahead, behind, on either side by ships moving in the same direction. The helmsman who was working both the steering and the engine controls, normally they're controlled separately, they had him working with one guy in charge, and he was having problems holding course. So the captain stepped in and ordered that the two functions be separated, giving a second sailor control of the engines. But those two crewmen were temporarily assigned from another ship and were not fully trained on the specifics of the control console. As a result, the transfer, transfer was done improperly, resulting in four minutes of complete confusion. All, as Murphy's Law will have it, all this happened just as McCain was passing the merchant vessel Alnick. Unfortunately, McCain's watch team got fixated on the equipment problem, forgot about the merchant vessel right next to it. They tried to slow down, and at the same time, they drifted in front of the Alnick. So they're going like this, and then drifted over like that, which then struck McCain on the port quarter. For you landlubbers in the audience, that means it's on the left side about two-thirds of the way back. As a result, 10 sailors in one of the aft berthing compartments lost their lives. I won't go into all the other things that the two ships did wrong. Suffice to say that the investi investigation reports are very sobering. The lessons we've learned over time in the Navy about how to operate ships have been written in blood. And when we ignore those rules, bad things happen. As a final point, these two reports are not the end of this process. JAG manual investigations are still ongoing. So disciplinary proceedings are still very much under consideration, and I think there's a very good chance there will be at least one court-martial as a result. That brings me to the second, and in my view, the more important causes of these accidents, the systemic failures that directly or indirectly created the circumstances that allowed the collisions to happen. These system-wide problems are hardly new. In fact, they've been in the making for two decades or more. In each case, they've been the result of decisions taken at senior levels, not out in the fleet, but here in Washington. So let me be very clear. I don't for a moment think that anyone in a position of authority made consciously stupid decisions aimed at degrading readiness or weakening the Navy. In every case, good people were doing their best to meet demanding requirements with limited resources. But the key factor in every one of the areas I'm going to point out is a lack of funds pure and simple. The lack of resources is reflected in the Navy's overall approach to supporting the fleet. In essence, it's based on efficiency rather than effectiveness. As a result, our procurement, personnel, training, maintenance, and support decisions are based on getting the, the job done at the lowest possible cost, leaving minimal margin for error. In other words, just enough to get by. The result has been a lowering of both everyday standards and overall readiness. One of the most egregious problem areas was shipboard manning. Now, before any new class of ship is commissioned, the Navy does an in-depth study of its manning requirements. That leads to what, a document that's called the ship's manning document that identifies every crew position, how much time they spend in various activities, the required levels of experience, and specific training qualifications. And it's based on a normal work day of around 14 hours. By the way, that's not much when you're out at sea. But lack of funding for personnel has seriously undercut that otherwise rational and fully justified approach. Our ships are now manned at only around 90% of proper levels, often with sailors who have neither the necessary training nor the experience to do the job well. In fact, for ships based in Japan, we have manning shortfalls of up to 20% in certain specialties. About 15 years ago, the Navy decided to cut ships' crews even more to save money, telling the fleet that if they were only more imaginative and more automated, they could get by with an additional 5 to 10% manning reduction. To make it all sound great, they called it the Optimal Manning pro Program. I won't tell you what I called it. We're in a mixed audience here. They, 
Needless to say, nobody was fooled. The Navy ar also arbitrarily redefined its st standard shipboard workday up to 15 hours rather than 14, as if that would solve the undermanning problem. It should come as no surprise that crew exhaustion caused by overwork and high operational tempo was identified in both Fitzgerald and McCain as directly contributing to their collisions. Schools and training is another area where the Navy's leaders made bad decisions to compensate for inadequate funding. Traditional schools were closed and courses were shortened. Training quality was downgraded, with more reliance on cheaper computer-based training instead of highly qualified and, and experienced instructors. My experience with computer-based instruction that is that it's okay for basic introductory training, but it cannot compare with the in-depth understanding and analytical framework provided by a good teacher. As specific examples, training was cut for new surface warfare officer indoctrination, for some key enlisted members of the bridge teams, and for the electronic technicians that maintain the Navy's surface search radars. In each case, this lack of formal training was cited as a contributing factor in the collisions. One of the common denominators in both collisions was that the bridge teams lost situational awareness, got focused on a single aspect of the tactical situation, and ignored what else was happening around them. That's a hard problem, and I don't think it's one that can be solved just by improving training, although that's part of it. Experience at sea is in complex situations is what develops the ability to sort out confusing scenarios while still keeping the big picture. That's one of the reasons why it's so important for the captain to be on the bridge in a tight situation. He has, or at least should have, more experience than anybody else on board. But what we've seen over time has been a series of decisions that have reduced the opportunity for at-sea experience in ship handling for every level of the ship's officers. Captains and executive officers now spend more time ashore before they are sent to their, sh before they are sent to their ships. Many surface department heads have spent part of their tours in Iraq and Afghanistan as individual augmentees supporting the Army and Marines. A worthwhile effort, but one that deprives them of critical operational experience at sea. And the way we've set up sequential sea duty assignments for junior officers was identified as one factor depriving them of the chance to fully develop their in-depth professional skills. This brings me to the final, and in my mind, the most serious problem. For the last 15 to 20 years, the Navy's force structure has been gradually declining, even as their operational requirements have expanded. As a result, the Navy's approximately 275 combatants are now required to keep over 100 ships forward deployed, just as they did back in the 90s, when the fleet was about 35% larger. It's like a rubber band that's being gradually stretched. At some point, it's going to break. Now, these operational requirements are not just dreamed up by the CNO. They're levered by the Joint Chiefs of Staff based on inputs from the various combatant commanders, such as PACOM, UCOM, and CENTCOM. I can't really blame those commanders and their staffs for wanting to have as much force as possible backing them up. They want to reduce risk. That makes sense. But for far too long, our naval forces have been saddled with far more than they have the capacity to deliver. The response has been simply a hearty can-do, and they just get on with it. But as we're seeing now, the price has been high. In essence, the problem is a lack of sufficient ships and aircraft combined with an unwillingness by our leaders to tailor commitments to reflect our reduced numbers. As a result, as Seth pointed out, we've seen ships deployments extended from six months to eight or nine months. That means the ships are run harder and longer, giving them less time back home to repair casualties, do regular maintenance, and work up for the next deployment. And when ships are finally able to get into a major repair facility, the ever-present lack of funds means that important repair work that ought to, be, ought to be done by a shipyard is simply reassigned to the ship's crew, ignoring the fact that the crews already have a full load of maintenance tasks saved up for those repair periods. Of course, that means the crew's going to have to work longer hours, take less leave and delay attending important schools that had been deferred until they were in the shipyard. It's not as if the Navy hasn't pointed out to our civilian leadership the harm that results from this constant demand for forward deployed ships. But in the end, I think the ultimate responsibility lies with the Navy's own leaders. <laughs>
I certainly know from my own experience the commanding officers are under enormous pressure to get their ships underway to meet commitments even when they're undermanned and have equipment problems. You just don't say no. As a result of these recent collisions in 7th Fleet, the CNO was quoted as saying that he would support fleet commanders and ship captains who declined to get their ships underway if they didn't have the required people, equipment, and certifications. If only that were true. Frankly, I'm skeptical. I've seen in the past where captains have honestly said their ships couldn't meet a commitment. And as a result, the ships were tied up at the pier, long overdue actions were taken to rectify the problems, and in the meantime, some other ship was sent to sea in its place. But that was a pyrrhic victory. I've seen that as a result, those same captains were viewed as non-team players who lacked the necessary can-do spirit. And as a consequence, their, their careers were essentially capped. Now, sadly, I don't think, pro think this problem is going to stop until people here in Washington are viewed as the ones responsible. They were the ones who made the policies that cut back on critical training, reduced spare parts, underfunded maintenance, didn't provide enough personnel, or didn't stand up against excessive and unnecessary tasking. And that's where we need to look for answers. Thank you. With that one, I, I can be quick. I will, excuse me, Jim. Well, thank you very much, Seth, uh, for inviting me. That was a terrific thank remarks, you. both by you and by Admiral Stark. And also, uh, Rep Gallagher, uh, Representative Gallagher, gave a terrific speech as well. So, to talk about a couple of things that we've already addressed, I wanted to show some pictures, so kind of jazz it up a little bit and also uh, bring out four main points which I'll discuss here. So the first one is, we just discussed, and Admiral Stark just raised, the, the kind of overarching systemic problem that we're facing, which is the Navy has shrunk in the last 20 years, as depicted here, by about 20%. The number of ships has shrank by about 20%. We've kept the number of ships forward deployed or at sea deployed uh, at about 100 ships during that time, regardless of the fleet's shrinkage, which means each ship is doing about 20% more work. Uh, what that translates into is longer deployments, more frequent deployments. So deployments back in 1998, you know, about 20 years ago, uh, only about 4% of, the, of those were longer than six months. And so back in that Navy, to have a, when I remember having deployments, uh, having a deployment longer than six months was a big deal. You had to get senior people to approve it. It was significant. Uh, today, every deployment's longer than six months. And the average deployment has gone from 180 days, it was right around that six month point in 1998, to uh, over 200 days today. So we're, we're deploying guys and gals longer, uh, more frequently to service this demand signal that Admiral Stark talked about. The, uh, the implications of that are multiple fold. So it's not just this fundamental supply demand mismatch that does cause the fleet to be overworked. What it also means is uh, ships don't have reliable schedules and ships are not able to meet timelines to be able to do maintenance uh, as planned, uh, which means that when you go into a maintenance availability, uh, you're probably gonna have to do more work than you anticipated because you might have missed a previous availability. It also means that if your schedule changes and you can't do an availability that you had planned to do, you're gonna delay work till later. So all that does is increase costs and increase the likelihood that you're gonna have material problems on a ship. Uh, what else is going on here is the, the Navy is going to try to grow the fleet over the next uh, decade or so, and we're going to try to get to 355. One thing that, the, that those projections don't really take into account is end strength, and we talked about manning. And if you look at the Navy's end strength projections, they don't really address the needed increase in number of people that would support this larger fleet. Uh, and so that's something that has to be considered as well. And one last thing on this is uh, there's been a lot of discussion recently about bringing ships out of retirement uh, in order to just bump up the numbers. Uh, there's a couple problems with that. One is this end strength question of, well, where are the people going to come from that would man those ships? Uh, and then second, uh, what are those ships going to do? Because these ships that you bring out of retirement are not necessarily as combat capable as those in the service now. Are we going to send them out to do lower end missions that wouldn't require a high tech missile defense system, even though we've seen examples of the need for high, de high tech missile defenses, even places uh, like the Middle East where the Houthis are shooting cruise missiles at us? 
And then also, if you do deploy them to these low-end missions, you're not really helping the Navy's problem, because today we don't really do that many of those missions already because of this supply-demand mismatch. So there's some, there's some subtleties involved in this overarching problem of supply-demand uh, that sometimes get forgotten, which is it's not just about money. It's about also providing predictable schedules for ships, predictable, predictable funding, as Re Representative Gallagher addressed. The second big point is this is not just a Navy problem, this is also a Marine Corps problem. The Marine Corps is facing the same constraints on its ability to deploy. So right now, uh, with the reduction in strength that the, Navy, that the Marine Corps is now trying to reverse, uh, they are at the point where they are just able to maintain a two to one deployment ratio with Marines. Even though we've gotten out of Iraq to some degree and Afghanistan to some degree, the number of Marines deployed in, on ships and ashore is such that they are just able to maintain a one to two deployment ratio among the operating force, meaning Marines are home for two times as long as they are deployed, which is not a great rotation ratio. If you do a six month deployment and you're only home for a year and you're doing another six month deployment after that, that's an operational tempo that's very difficult to keep up for Marines. Now luckily, they're mostly young and they you know, work them like that on purpose, but it's not a, a situation that's likely to result in retention of Marines and it's gonna erode their readiness over time. So. Even though we've gotten out of some land wars that we thought were going to alleviate the Marines' challenges, they are now in a position where they're still deploying at a rate that's going to cause them to not be able to stay ready or necessarily keep the people they want to keep. But the third point I want to bring up is uh, we think about growing the fleet, and Representative Gallagher brought up the idea we need to have a, what's the rationale for that? What's the story for that? Uh, so if you think about great power competition, as Seth just addressed, China is obviously uh, a major player there. It's obviously a maritime environment. Uh, a couple of things to keep in mind here is, our, as, as Congressman Gallagher brought up, you're not going to be able to, if there's an altercation between China and one of its neighbors like Taiwan or Japan or the Philippines, uh, we're not going to be able to fight our way in to contribute to that conflict. Uh, the, the, the ability of their uh, long-range uh, missiles and sensors to keep us away and hold us at risk is going to slow down any American response such that it, by the time you get there, it's largely uh, done. And being able to overturn those results is going to be probably unpalatable to the international community. So you've got to be there and be able to deter and engage in that conflict when it occurs. Uh, on top of that, you're seeing China mount what they call informationized warfare, which is a very low intensity but high-end technical uh, form of conflict where they slowly accrete influence and territory over time in the East and South China Seas in this particular example. And so we're gonna have to be able to compete with them at relatively small scales and at low levels of escalation every day to sort of push back on that uh, attempt on their part to gain hegemony over everything inside the first island chain, comprising Japan, Taiwan, uh, and the Philippines, and, and Malaysia. So that, that is gonna require a day-to-day -day presence of very capable high-end forces with new operational concepts that allow them to operate in a relatively contested environment. So it's a different way of operating, but it requires naval forces to be there and be forward uh, continuously. And then on the other end of the world there, uh, we think of Russia as being a land conflict, conflict, and so we're the Army. I just talked with some Army leaders this morning, and they're focused on this challenge uh, and how they need to prepare for this challenge and forward posture and be ready to fight uh, in this kind of environment. The difficulty they face, and this is something that UCOM and uh, NAVIR leaders have expressed, is if NATO is unable to come to agreement on a response to a Russian incursion because it's conducted under the auspices of this kind of gray zone or what they call new generation warfare, uh, they could call, it could delay a response such that by the time NATO figures out what it wants to do, the Russian troops are already rolling into whatever capital they've decided to go after or across the Sawaki Gap that separates Kaliningrad from Belarus. So they could take over that area. They could cut off NATO reinforcements very easily and very quickly. What that means is naval forces might be our only unilateral option to respond to this event without having to rely on forces that are based in, in NATO. So that unilateral response coming from sea is gonna put a demand signal on naval forces that we're not even really thinking about yet uh, and are gonna have to eventually source. And one, once again, we could create this supply demand mismatch for a theater that we didn't think we were gonna necessarily have to worry about. Uh, so that could be a, an additional problem. But that, again, it gets back to what's the rationale for growing the fleet? And it can't just be, we need to address the readiness problem. That's clearly part of it, but there's also gotta be a rationale for how do we deal with great power competition? And that's an argument for growing the fleet as well. And that's it. <laughs>
I will turn that over to uh, Seth or to Brian so that we can complete. Thank you, the, Brian. Yes. You're welcome. Well done. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Wait, one more, Brian. Are you taking up your time? No, no problem. You should. Uh, well, we've almost used up our time, but um, if there are questions, um, we'll, we'll take a few. If you would tell us who you are, who you're with, and um, to whom your question is addressed, we'll try to provide an answer. Gentleman in the back of the room. Uh, Henry Hetker, retired government. Uh, in view of these recent naval collisions, uh, they say it's only a fraction of all the total collisions of vessels in the world. Uh, is there a need to upgrade and utilize the latest Japanese electronics we now find in our automobiles and the latest models? You have side scan alert and you have radar remote control braking. Uh, I, whether this is compatible with the ship's electronics, I'm not certain, but anything could be improved. Uh, and if it can be, even foreign merchant ships or anybody's merchant ship, uh, it would might reduce uh, the disasters that we're encountering. I'll take a cut at it. Uh, I think that the modern ships already have a lot of electronics on board. They, they use a system, I think it's called ARPA, Advanced Radar uh, Plotting System. So the radars it actually do the plots and figure out the CPAs that sell, it, themselves. That assumes, of course, that the equipment's properly working and that the radar is properly adjusted. In the case of Fitzgerald, they found out the radar was not properly adjusted. And so there, there's a danger when you rely too much on automatic systems and you don't check them yourself. It's not hard to figure out a CPA on a ship. Uh, to do it visually and through, through a, a radar to get the distances, and it only takes about three to four minutes to plot that out and know exactly when they're gonna come, come past you. And so, uh, in my mind, and again, it, uh, it makes me feel really old to say back in my day, but back in my day, it wasn't a problem to, to keep these things, uh, these solutions coming in so that you knew what was going on around you. In the case of, of certainly Fitzgerald, they, did, they didn't even bother. So they weren't, they weren't figuring out these things, either apparently either from the automated radar system or using their own, uh, own plotting techniques. And, and that's one of the things that really led them to a collision. Also, AIS, the automated uh, identification system, which all ships uh, above like 10,000 tons have to subscribe to, allows you to have a visual you know, plot of where all the ships are around you, as long as everybody's actually using their AIS transmitters, which the U.S. generally has not because it does reveal your location and the nature of your ship. But perhaps when you're in these tight vessel traffic schemes, it'd be a good idea to do that. And in the report, the, the Navy talks about the need to do that. Yeah. Well, in fact, the, the, the ships, the, the AIS systems were on in the passive mode, which meant that they were receiving all the information on those other ships. The other ships just didn't have information on the U.S. Navy ship. So even with the information on what the courses and speeds were that were coming in, they didn't use it. So uh, you can take all, you can take, take that, the horse at, uh, or the bridge teams and lead them to water and all, all that information, but, but if they're not going to use it, then it's not going to help. Well, the difference being that if you, if, you, if you turn on your AIS transmitter, then the other guy sees you on yeah. his AIS, because he doesn't see you on radar because our ships don't show up very well on radar by design. Uh, so you have to think of yourself as being like a motorcycle out there, which means if I can somehow provide indication to him that I'm there, at least if I'm stupid, maybe he'll be smart enough to avoid me. Question in the front. Yes, I have a sidebar question. Is your uh, hello, sir? Here it is. Thank you. I have a sidebar question. Is there a plan for wind at two thousand eighteen? And is there a tremendous value for wind at? <clears throat> so far as I know, there's no nothing's changed. Uh, impact plans for impact are proceeding. Um, for 2018, um, I could offer some suggestions about uh, why, yeah, w what their value would, is and how it might be increased. Uh, I don't see why China is part of it, um, nor do I see why Taiwan is not part of it. Um, I, it doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, it does make a great deal of sense that uh, collective democratic collective efforts of democratic states should be applied to what is obviously an increasing threat in East Asia. Uh, 
So I think Rimpac is a is a worthy enterprise and one that ought to be continued with some modification. It looks from my Sir. Well, I'm glad you mentioned this because uh, uh, what is the disclaimer? We're going to have a conference on exactly this subject in the future um, and uh, want to take your concerns to this administration and tell Mr. Tillerson that would be very helpful. Um, it's a big problem. Uh, Taiwan is at the center of the, is at the hinge of the first island chain. Uh, their defenses, as some of you who read the New York Times Sunday article this past Sunday, uh, their military is not as uh, formidable as it was 25 or 30 years ago. Um, they're increasingly isolated by countries around the world who are bullied by China. Um, one result is they're trying to build their own indigenous submarines, and it's not easy to do. Ask the Australians. So, they, I agree with you. I think we have time for one more question. Sir. Otto Kreischer with Sea Power Magazines, probably for the Admiral and, and for Brian. Uh, the, the Congressman made a pitch for the 52 uh, small surface combatants. The Navy has never been a particularly big fan of, of small combatants. During the Jimmy Carter era, we, he kind of forced the Navy to take the the Fig Sevens, the Perry class, uh, which we got an, an awful lot of use out of. But the two of you, you know, given the situation, the, the crisis, the threat that we're facing, what, do we you know, the smaller ships that we could buy more of, the uh, hauls in the water, is that a solution, or do we really need more of the high-end uh, platforms? I happen to think that uh, small ships are very important, and there's an, and there's a, a great real role for them. Um, in fact, we had the 1052s, a large class. We had the Perrys, uh, and now we, we brought in the LCS. Um, I, we can get into a whole other discussion of LCS. I think it's a really bad design, and it has been from the very beginning. That the requirements were wrong. However, if we get the, if we get the design fixed and, and put some weapons on the ship and get the modules that are supposed to be on it to work properly, it can be a very capable ship. But we've sacrificed a lot to give it speed that it doesn't need. Uh, but other than other than that, however, whatever form those specific hulls take, uh, we need small small combatants for lots of different things around the world, not just in low intensity conflict, but also in a major war. As you recall, during the 70s and 80s, during the height of the Cold War, uh, the requirement in the United States Navy was for well over 100 frigates in order to escort convoys and amphibious ships and, and uh, uh, replenishment vessels. So there's a real requirement for that, even at the high end of, of the spectrum. Uh, yeah, and if you, if you look in the fleet architecture study that Brian and I did, ding, the, uh, the, we made the argument for small surface combatants as being a component of littoral combat groups or small surface combatant groups, because you can put on small combatants today very capable sensors, and you can put VLS on them, so they can do some of the same high-end missions that a destroyer would do, but just at a different capacity level. Uh, and it would allow you to spread the fleet out, more distributed force, and also address the need for escorting and protecting of non-combatant ships and civilian vessels that you know, today would not really be defended by anybody because our high-end combatants are going to be tied up protecting carriers and, and doing ballistic missile defense ashore. Look, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for joining us today and for staying. Uh, a couple of things. Um, uh, that book over there will be for sale, and uh, the, its author will be happy to uh, autograph it. Um, and uh, 
for those of you who are interested in this subject, um, we will have uh, another and um, in-depth discussion uh, of maritime strategy and the future um, before the end of the year. And Ryan McGrath there will be right up here. Uh, so I, I look forward to that, and I hope that uh, you'll watch your email box and so on and so forth and join us then, and thank you again for joining us today. Okay.